Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm Olivia. Um, oh, I'm Zoe. <laughs> Thank you for having us. We're really excited and it's been amazing so far. Really inspiring stuff. Yeah, really, really it has been. Um, so a bit about our video. Um, our reason our reason for making the videos has come um, from our collective and personal experiences. Um, for me, it started at university where I suffered from um, some significant life events. And when I went to, I felt like I needed some support. And when I went for support, um, the support I received was a medical diagnosis. Um, in, and that was ADHD. Um, but in fact, I knew that I was grieving and I lacked the the, 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 yeah, the social support that I felt that I needed at the time. However, that my experiences, my my experiences of the grief were not validated and were only I only felt like I was heard when I my medicalized diagnosis was present. And this then that prob that kind of created more problems in itself and led to me feeling really lonely and it was a lonely time for me. However, I over lockdown, um, I was able to move in with my close group of friends. And in that space, it was when it clarified and I realized the importance of solidarity and community and support structures. And it was only then that I was given my the space for healing. Um, and it was through that that we wanted to create or we wanted to create yeah, these videos. Yeah, so the videos are motivated by our own experiences, but also we've noticed a lot of similar experiences in our peers and we very strongly feel that um, the culture of medicalization and language of medicalization has really shaped our generation and created a really large sense of disconnection for a lot of people that we interact with. And we think this has been particularly obvious during lockdown. So we've started this project, um, making these videos with a general theme of trying to show how emotional experiences are caused by external conditions with the hope that um, these videos are one way that we can reach some people, particularly in our generation that might not be engaged with the more academic side of discourse around medicalization and its failures. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And I hope we hope you enjoy watching it. Yeah, thanks. Oh, also, I'm going to post some links to our um, to our pages in the chats. If anyone likes our stuff, we'd love a follow. <laughs> Thanks. There's no denying that the lockdown is saving lives, but behind closed doors up and down the country, people are struggling to cope. The number of people now experiencing severe mental illnesses has increased since the last lockdown. The people presenting with acute mental illness has gone up and that they, the severity of the illness seems to have gone up as well. This is a time where a lot of people are feeling anxiety. Quite frankly, I imagine most people are. Most people are. During the pandemic, many of us have suffered emotionally. People are alone in lockdown, separated from, worrying about or even losing loved ones. Many of us are living in difficult conditions, struggling to stay afloat financially or struggling to cope with care burdens. And everything is uncertain. But how do we draw the line between understandable human responses to the difficult times we all face and mental disorders that are assumed to be abnormal pathological conditions. At what point does someone suffering stop being a normal part of the human experience and enter into the realm of mental illness in need of professional attention? Well, the answer is that we don't really know. Despite its scientific guise, mental health problems aren't objective or scientifically defined. In fact, the term has been used to refer to all sorts of things at different points in time and in different places. The number of behaviours officially categorised as mental health disorders has increased from 105 in 1952 to 
507 in 2016. And research has shown that these categories of disorder are very much products of culture, not science. What is seen as abnormal human behaviour changes and is highly dependent on the prevailing social norms of the time. Up until the late 90s, depression as a concept remained virtually unknown in Japan. In fact, Japan has a long history of Buddhism that encourages the acceptance of sadness and discourages the pursuit of constant happiness. So when people experienced emotions like sadness or feeling low, they had cultural tools that encouraged them to understand this as an inevitable part of the human experience. In other words, there was an understanding that emotional suffering was not only an inescapable part of life, but also part of what gave life depth and meaning. The cultural tools we have to understand suffering are quite different. The concept of mental illness encourages an understanding of suffering that makes us imagine there is something going wrong with us as an individual. The word mental places the focus on us and our own minds, and the word ill implies that there's something pathologically wrong with us. The problem with this is that medicalising our emotions depoliticises them. It encourages us to see emotional experiences as dangerous internal malfunctions rather than the outcome of living in a complex and uncertain world with huge inequality and a broken political and economic system that benefits a tiny global elite at the expense of the masses. It shifts the locus of change from fixing the cultures around us that might be perpetuating our struggles to fixing the problem that we are told is inside of us. Even in the pandemic, when we recognise that the cause of our suffering is from situations beyond our control, we still tend to process our feelings through looking inwardly for solutions within our own heads rather than outside of us. Imagine if we understood the majority of our emotions, not through language and ideas given to us by medicine, but through the language of politics that harnesses dissatisfaction and suffering in order to connect us to greater meaning beyond ourselves. Isn't this often what people want when they feel emotional struggle? A reason to see meaning and hope in their life? We have a unique opportunity now. Instead of trying to fix the emotions we feel in this difficult time, we can use them to bring us together and change some of the pressing injustices and societal discontents of our time. The pandemic has shown us more clearly than ever that suffering is not only caused by individual weaknesses. And that has power, because when we recognise the significance of emotions, they become forces for transformation rather than forces to be feared. The suffering, loneliness and powerlessness that people have felt during the pandemic is not an illness to be cured. It's a political energy. And we could use it to drive connection and re-infuse our lives with the community, purpose and support we all desperately need.